is one sample Watanabe's house. After one coin trust repair and maintenance remain, it's open to be open to the public as a tourist facility. So you can see they have exhibition inside, and the photo and everything was donated from Watanabe's family. And here, the gentleman here, you can see he, he stand here, and I'm so, I'm so proud of myself. Yes, they are. They have a strong cultural identity. Uh, they are citizen members of Hockey Tourism Guide Association. They will guide the facilities and then other uh, her heritage, cultural heritage facilities in Hockey City. Okay, let's all, uh, I introduce some special policy and the system which are designed to pres preserve historic building and also indirectly establish many house museums. And let me finish my presentation by summarizing two points. From this case study, what's the meaning of historic building preserved as a museum have for the local community? Museum is one of the popular formats to conserve cultural heritage in Japan right now. Because the museum is widely recognized as an effect, effective means. We can do okay. Thank you. An active means to conserve and neutralize cultural heritage, improve people's cultural identity, or as a cultural tourism resource at which being, bring money to us and so on. Government's efforts are far not enough, so citizens' awareness is extremely essential. Those case studies take cultural history and the museum as a start point. Lead local people and local residents to raise their awareness in order to hand over this cultural heritage to the next generation. And I think the most important thing is to raise people's awareness of the relationship between themselves and the museum. Because if um, they, you, 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 how can I say, you, you aware, raise their awareness about the cultural heritage, how important and they to, how lucky I am. <laughs> Yes, okay. And they, they learn their history and the culture again. They will, re, uh, will realize uh, how, how the history and the culture are important to themselves. Then they will uh, make their own connection between themselves and the museum. Therefore, communication of two sides can be construct. And then museum can be really, uh, can really be a local caretaker of cultural heritage. Um, another point is challenge to the future. In recent years, Japan is facing the reality of this de de decreasing and aging population, especially in this uh, traditional building preservation district. We can see increasing tourists and decreasing local residents, which result in develop uh, this, uh, preserve, this area we want to preserve, but finally is developed as a tourism site. So there are many illegal events destroy the local landscape. It's an issue to keep people's daily life and protect the cultural property and develop a city at the same time. For improve the issue of landscape destruction by tourism, in many cities, local residents, they compose a civic groups and to promote landscape conservation with local industry and experts and the local governments. And some museums for inheriting to the next generation, some museums are starting focus on school education. Uh, in a few of the fact that the many, museum, uh, many activities in museums are running by adults. Uh, so museums need to encourage the participants participation of young people through the museum activities and to enhance their sense of concern. In Japan, uh, most of the uh, school, they will teach you uh, how to learn your local history, but they don't teach you how could you observe and understand your culture in your uh, local area. And I think this is, uh, this is the most uh, important thing that the museum needs to do, teach children to do the research by themselves. 
And okay, and let's bring brings me to the end of this presentation. And Japan has many interesting museum case study, and you are more than welcome to discover by yourself. But before I close my presentation, as a representative of Icon Japan, I would like to invite everyone to come to Kyoto. We are looking forward to seeing you in general conference in Kyoto 2019. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias Jenny por la interesante presentación que has dado. Ahora quisiera seguir a la siguiente, eh, se titula El legado involuntario de Joseph Schneider House eh, y la imparte Hillary Walker Guggen. Ella estudia actualmente el doctorado en la Universidad de Toronto, Canadá. Su trabajo de investigación se enfoca en el impacto que genera la retroalimentación sensorial de los visitantes a las casas museos históricas. Walker está particularmente interesada en los, en los usos creativos que se les da a las nuevas tecnologías dentro de los museos para que las sociedades contemporáneas preserven su legado cultural. Parte de su trabajo se ha presentado ante organizaciones profesionales, en foros académicos e instituciones educativas alrededor del mundo. Fue distinguida este año con la beca de investigación Edna Stebler de la Joseph Schneider House en Kitchener, Canadá. Su artículo revelando fotografías, espacios íntimos, puede ser consultado en la edición de marzo de 2015 de la publicación Interiors, Design, Architecture and Culture. Muchas gracias. Is that, is that good? Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I always look forward to Dim his conferences, and I look forward. Oh, closer? Yes, okay. <laughs> a little higher. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I look forward to the uh, conversations that we'll have in the next couple of days. Opening its doors on a sunny September afternoon in 1981, the Joseph Snyder House in Kitchener, Canada uses living history to demonstrate the lifestyles of a Mennonite family who left a humble and unintentional legacy. I will examine how the multiple legacies of one house museum strengthened the historical fabric of society on a local level and supported the national reconfiguration of Canadian heritage. Still? <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> is, that, is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. The Snyders arrived to the area now known as Waterloo Region, Ontario, Canada in 1806, along with several other Mennonites. The new immigrants walked alongside Conestoga wagons, so as you can see here, what a Conestoga wagon looks like. And the trip lasted for four weeks and four days, all the way from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, down here at the bottom. The, the Mennonites sought. So sorry. <laughs> so, so sorry. Let me see. I don't know why is it. Am I moving around too much? Is that? Is this better? I've got too much stuff. <laughs> All right. Is this good? I'll try not to move. Okay. So the Mennonites came from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and um, they sought the remote and untamed lands of Upper Canada to lead a life apart from the world. These early pioneers founded a new community centered on their Pennsylvania German culture. Joseph Snyder established the first homestead in the, in the settlement. The house that now hosts the museum was constructed circa 1816. Joseph Snyder would have never imagined that the threads of his life would create the base for such a rich legacy. The interpretation period of the House Museum is the 1850s. At this time, the second generation of Snyders, Joseph Ebby Snyder, and his wife Sarah and their nine children lived in the house. The Snyder's homestead was a welcoming place for family and friends. Joseph and, his, Joseph and Sarah's daughter, Louisa, left a, di a diary that offers insight into the richly textured lives that unfolded within the walls of Snyder House. Louisa recalls, my parents were very social people. Their home was a regular stopping place for everybody. 
many people who lived in the Waterloo County would come to visit, not only relatives, but acquaintances and company from Pennsylvania. We had so much company that at times we would be afraid to look up the road for fear we would see a dockwagel coming, for if we did see one, it would surely head for our place. Friday was bake day. We would bake 25 pies, 10 large old-fashioned loaves of bread, and a couple dozen buns. Often on Monday morning, we would have to bake again because we had so much company over Sunday, there was nothing left." End quote. An important part of the Mennonite culture focuses on fostering a strong community. Friendships and familiar ties were reinforced through shared meals after attending services at the meeting house on Sunday mornings. The, Snyder house was made, the Snyders' lives was made richer through meaningful ties to the broader community. Berlin as a community. The fabric of the community became richer as new threads were incorporated throughout the 1820s. The early Mennonite community attracted European-German immigrants for several reasons. The thick bush had been reasonably settled, German was the dominant language, and the region was known to have cheap land. The decade between 1825 and 1835 saw tremendous growth as new immigrants developed the village. By the 1850s, the formidable forests of Upper Canada had been tamed into a respectable settlement known as Berlin. The town reflected the German-centric population. Berlin quickly became a manufacturing center with goods being sold clear, clear across the Dominion. The artist here was a bit progressive in adding the train on the side here because the train didn't come until several years after this picture was made, but they had high hopes. The business people um, all had to speak uh, German here, and Louisa has a, a diary entry from uh, that illustrating the daily patterns of the village. Everybody had to speak German in Berlin. The business people did not do business unless they could speak German, as they could not wait on their customers. The unique character of Berlin set it apart from the primarily British culture that blanketed the rest of the colony. In 1886, a reporter from the Toronto Mail described Berlin as a patch of old Germany set down in the Garden of Ontario. As the village even erected an outdoor bust of Kaiser Wilhelm I in 1896. By the end of the century, Berlin welcomed new residents of British descent who embraced the Germanic lifestyle and benefited from the village's industrious nature. The German character of the village was reinforced through celebrations of their heritage. Cultural clubs such as the Concordia hosted events like the Sangerfest, a community song festival that provided a sense of belonging and welcome to the community irregardless of social class and heritage. This sentiment changed as, nature, not, as nations and individuals grappled with the unsettling implications of the First World War. By 1914, military activities accelerated across Canada as communities began recruitment campaigns. It was widely known that men with German last names were not welcome in the ranks. There were reports of strange and unknown Canadian men with German, Austrian, or Turkish names being arrested and returned home by the British War Office. Historian Patricia McKegney argues that this situation was made worse through the cumulative effect of Canadian and British propaganda campaigns throughout 1915. The violently anti-German message alienated the, the German-Canadian population of Berlin, resulting in markedly low enlistment numbers. Not only did the anti-German rhetoric fracture the social structure of the community, it also threatened the manufacturing center's viability. Products stamped with the Made in Berlin label were no longer selling. Citizens of Berlin, Ontario grappled with the choice of changing the town's name. In February 1916, a formal resolution was put forward to change the name. Leading citizens of both British and German descent organized the British League to rally support for the name change. In May 1916, a record number of voters participated in a referendum to settle the debate. The results were in favor of the change by a narrow margin of only 81 votes. At length, another vote was held to decide what the name would actually be. Only 892 people, a mere 18% of the eligible population, participated. Of the votes, there were 163 ballots with all options crossed out and Berlin, or Waterloo, the neighboring city, penciled in. 
Ultimately, the name Kitchener was selected after Lord Kitchener, England's Secretary of State for War. In the aftermath of the civil trauma that unfolded during the First World War, historians John English and Kenneth McLaughlin observed that Berlin's signs and icons disappeared from the streets of Kitchener. Few would talk about the Kaiser's bust now melted down into souvenir napkin holders. There was a marked silence surrounding the violence that stole the community's proud cultural heritage. The trauma of this period resulted in suppressed traditions and a deeply entrenched cultural amnesia. It took many years before inhabitants felt comfortable reviving their roots. The construction of a legacy. By the 1960s, Miriam Sokvitny, the fourth generation descendant of Joseph Snyder, worked intensely to ensure her family legacy was acknowledged. Sokvitny petitioned the Archaeological and Historic Sites Board of Ontario to have a plaque placed in front of her family's homestead. Sokvitny saw her work as an extension of her father, Joseph M. Snyder's, ambitions to ensure the history would not overlook the Snyder family's role in settling the area. In a speech given at the unveiling of the historic site's plaque, Savitny explains, this day is also giving me the opportunity of seeing the hopes of my father move one step closer to fulfillment. This was to have the home preserved as a memorial to those early pioneers, and I believe that the recognition of the old house by the Ontario Archaeological and Historic Sites Board is a step in the right direction." End quote. In addition to ensuring the significant building was added to the historic sites registry, Sakvitny also uh, collected family heirlooms and early 19th century period furnishings. Uh, Sakvitny is the one here with the candlestick. Sakvitny clearly states her intention of establishing the house as a living history museum in a letter to the director of the Historic Sites Board after the plaque was erected. Sakvitny writes, this introduces the next problem associated with this project, which to me is an obligation I would like to fulfill during my lifetime. That is, the creating of a living memorial to these early settlers in the restoration of the old home as a public museum." End quote. Sokvitny's ambition to transform the Snyder homestead into a living museum aligned with the growing national interest of heritage inspired by the 1967 centennial celebration of Canadian Confederation. The centennial celebration sparked a flood of enthusiasm for heritage the Archaeological and Historic Sites Board of Ontario was expanded and renamed the Ontario Heritage Foundation in 1967. The organization was intended to identify, preserve, protect, and promote heritage properties across the province. The 15 years following 1967 saw a sharp increase in small community and museums in Ontario. The Government of Canada crafted a national museum policy in 1972, stressing that every Canadian should have access to the country's heritage. And the Canadian Conservation Institute was created the same year. Locally, the Waterloo Regional Heritage Foundation was formed in 1973. As an umbrella organization, the Heritage Foundation was the first to distribute funds collected from taxpayers to use on regional heritage projects. The growth of the Canadian heritage sector reflected similar transformations occurring in other countries. Key developments in the United States influenced the Canadian approach to heritage field. Patrick Butler's article, Past, Present, and Future, The Place of the House Museum in the Museum Community, examines elements that have shaped the heritage landscape. In uh, the advanced nature of research that occurred in Virginia's uh, Colonial Williamsburg in the first half of the 20th century was a crucial step for establishing scientific-based approaches and applied research towards heritage buildings. This scholarship combined archaeological, architectural, and artifactual research with exciting new documentary work. This approach marked a deeper engagement with regional domestic history. Multiple histories, folklore versus evidence. Canadian house museums established in the first half of the 20th century were often run by concerned local citizens. A romanticized, nostalgic view of local history was usually employed in these interpretive narratives. A similar milieu had been established in Kitchener as residents reconnected with their past. Key elements that created this sentimentalized view in early of the early in Mennonite pioneers were Mabel Dunham's novel, uh, Trail of the Conestoga, published in 1924. Uh, in the middle of the slide, oh, 
There we go. In the middle of this slide, we have the Pioneer Memorial Tower built in 1926, extolling the Mennonites as the builders of Canada. And Edna Stiebler's series of books published throughout the 1960s, highlighting the wholesome Mennonite foodways and lifestyle. These materials formalize the community's folk traditions. It is in this context that Miriam Sakvitney determinedly carried forward her family's legacy. Miriam's speech at the unveiling of the historic sites plaque in 1966 weaves a romantic view of, her of the heroic settlers. The Stoic Snyders carved out a self-sufficient homestead with outbuildings, a sawmill, and an access road that became the main artery of the modern-day city. She described the interior of the house centered on an open hearth used for baking, cooking, and heating. The hearth was replaced by a stepped cook stove in 1850. However, she expressed hope to reconstruct the hearth on its original footings with vintage bricks. To conclude her remarks, Sakvitney extended an invitation to the gathering for the, op uh, for the unveiling to go to her house in the spirit of Fundenshof, in which her family fostered over a hundred years before. Miriam Sakvitney arranged the transfer of the family homestead to public ho holdings in 1974 with the understanding that the Waterloo Regional Heritage Foundation would oversee the restoration of the historic site. In light of the shifts of the Canadian cultural climate, board members of the Heritage Foundation purposefully broke with the traditional practices and developed the site with scientific rigor. Kenneth McLaughlin, then chairman of the Heritage Board, characterized this approach to the project. The historical restoration was more complex than recreating memories. It called upon precise and accurate restoration details from which one could reach out and touch the past in a way that novels and historical fiction cannot. In reading fiction, one suspends one's disbelief. With a historical restoration, one can only learn from history through painstaking details." End quote. McLaughlin's statements reflect the spirit of the times in which he worked. During the 1970s, emphasis rested on the facts in the face of romantic nostalgia. They hired a curator, Susan Burke, um, to manage the restoration of the, at the 1816 Pennsylvania German farmhouse. The process started with extensive feasibility studies and restoration plans. As work proceeded, the plans were revised based on the archaeological evidence. The most contentious change was the decision against recreating an open hearth in favor of reinstalling the stepped cook stove to stay true to the interpretation, the interpretation period. Weaving a community. The evidence-based restoration did cause controversy in the community. As the project neared completion, Sakvitney withdrew her support. She planned on withholding her collection of family heirlooms from the museum because her version of the past was not being told. Kitchener's local newspaper, The Record, constantly critiqued the expanding budget, questioned the restoration decisions, and doubted the necessity of the entire project. This conflict highlights the growing pains of a sector as it strove towards professionalization. However, the leading forces behind the restoration were able to forge meaningful relationships with the community. Susan Burke networked with multiple sectors within the region. For example, she cultivated relationships with regional Old Order Mennonites to contextualize the findings they uncovered during the restoration process. Members of the public were also invited to be involved at the museum in the very early stages. The house needed extensive restoration because it was converted into a duplex in the early 20th century. After investigative work was concluded, restoration work parties were hosted on the weekends. Carefully supervised volunteers provided cost-effective labor. Afterwards, participants would usually gather at Burke's house for a meal and socializing. This volunteer method reflects the working bees that early Mennonites used to build the community. Here's an example of a barn raising and the community meal held afterwards. The Snyder House, um, at the Snyder House, a strong social network of support for the museum was created while volunteers learned about historic building techniques and regional heritage. After the museum opened in 1981, Snyder House based many public programs on the working bee model. For example, the month of May is devoted to quilting bees. 
During one weekend, a group of Old Order Mennonite women complete an entire quilt on site. The Embroiders Guild provides demonstrations throughout the month, while school groups get hands-on practice stitching in the ditch on full-size quilts, learning the meaning behind traditional quilting patterns, and examining historic and contemporary quilts on display in the museum's galleries. Snyder House capitalized on the growing support for regional dramatic heritage. In 1984, the museum expanded its mission beyond interpreting the lifestyle of Joseph Ebby Snyder and his family to encourage the study and appreciation of German culture in Ontario by collecting, conserving, researching, and exhibiting folk and decorative art and documents from the area of Germanic settlement in Canada, primarily the region of Waterloo. The amended mission acknowledges the broader legacy left by many generations of German immigrants to the area. Other community organizations slowly reconnected with the region's German roots after the Second World War. The Concordia Club reopened in 1948. tuvo un Oktoberfest y esto continuó a un festival que fue sumamente exitoso. Hoy en día el Oktoberfest ha crecido a ser el más grande de toda América del Norte. La celebración incluye ahora una desfile anual de Thanksgiving y celebra de nuevo la diversidad cultural a través de estos migrantes alemanes. Ahora, ¿cómo vamos a entretejer una imagen mayor? La historia del Schneider House continúa. tenían un gran espíritu. Esa es la forma en la cual esta fundación tomó la creación del museo que tiene un legado todavía más relevante. La restauración y programas subsecuentes únicamente fueron logrados a través de la participación activa y sustancial de la comunidad. Al regresar a esta hermandad que unía a los ciudadanos originales, los residentes reclamaron su herencia ya olvidada. Marianne Sopetny donó piezas clave de los muebles de su familia al museo, a pesar de no permanecer involucrada con la institución por muchos años. Sotving, en última instancia, reconoció el espíritu de administración y participó en muchos programas antes de morir el periodo examinado. En este documento vio el péndulo ideológico entre lo que es el flor, flor nostálgico. Un papel muy importante en establecer el modelo de restauración basada en evidencia en Canadá. En el 82, Heritage Canada le dio al Schneider House la categoría de reconocimiento regional número uno por su sorprendente contribución a la preservación del legado cultural de Canadá como conforme y la interpretación de los museos sigue conservándose. Esto se vuelve en algo necesario. Tenemos que ver con mucho mayor cuidado el conflicto entre las historias románticas de Miriam Sorkidne y la dependencia de los hechos de la WRHF. Yo apoyo que una investigación continua tenga que llevarse a cabo para dejar, para lograr los mayores estándares. Sin embargo, a la luz de la historia y el énfasis de los visitantes, necesitamos cada vez más trabajar juntos para poder lograr el resultado final. Tiene que darse atención cuidadosa a la historia del pasado. Con las décadas, la composición cultural de la región de Waterloo ha evolucionado para dar la gran diversidad en el Canadá en su artículo. El significado de los lugares a través de las historias, Birgitscha pregunta, ¿Cómo puede la narrativa dominante intercambiarse por historias que contribuyan a nuevas perspectivas y generen oportunidades para que los visitantes se entiendan a sí mismos, a sus contemporáneos, a su posición en el mundo? Es un proceso continuo de creación en donde la gente utiliza diferentes aspectos de los sitios históricos para interpretarse como seres humanos en el espíritu de sus vidas, en el espíritu de su periodo histórico. Estamos entretejiendo el futuro de la historia y por lo tanto tenemos que asegurar que los legados sean intencionales porque todos estamos comprometidos con la sociedad y con la historia. Los hilos delicados de la comunidad, de la historia y la evidencia científica y el significado personal tienen que permanecer a la luz de las nuevas tecnologías de entretenimiento público del siglo XXI, las complejidades inherentes a la construcción narrativa de multifacética requieren de una concesitación crítica a lo largo de todo el proceso. Muchísimas gracias.
Muchas gracias a uh, nuestras dos ponentes. Ahora vamos a pasar una ronda de preguntas y respuestas. Entonces, quien quiera preguntar algo a cualquiera de las dos, por favor, sientan en libertad. ¿Alguien? ¿Alguna pregunta o comentario? Ah, allá. Yes. Thank you very much to both of you. It was really interesting. Um, Hillary, I'd like to ask Hillary. Quisiera preguntándote algo. Hablas de la, una herencia de la diáspora y uno pudiera argumentarse que el legado de la diáspora se refleja mucho mejor o refleja mucho mejor los valores, los valores tradicionales que la herencia cultural, porque estás diciendo que piensan que su tradición se habían suprimido, pero de hecho no fue así. Ellos de alguna manera no tuvieron que sufrir de la siglo y la conmemoración a través de los momentos. Eso es una forma de así que es una forma de representar en otras palabras lo que yo quisiera preguntarte es lo siguiente. Tú, de alguna manera, presentas este legado cultural a los visitantes de la tierra madre como una herencia, un legado mucho más auténtico, ¿cómo lo presentas tú? De hecho, yo no estoy trabajando en el museo. Tuve una beca yo para investigación el último año. Y es muy interesante que la herencia alemana no es algo que se comunique de controversy and the, the way that the kitchen Por en la cual los residentes manejaron la división después de la Primera Guerra Mundial. La herencia alemana realmente se vio suprimida. Y Canadá es un lugar un tanto engañoso también, déjame decirte. Es cuestión de si tenemos o no nosotros una entidad nacional canadiense, porque hay una mezcla tan diversa. One of the th interesting things that I was going to um, point out with the parade, the Thanksgiving parade, the picture that I took was last weekend. And um, that parade, it was the Oktoberfest parade, and they're celebrating their German heritage, and that's um, a very strong thing. The, the Oktoberfest now goes for 10 days, I think, and everyone in the community embraces that German aspect of it. But the parade also had a Philippine marching band and a Vietnamese marching band Archa, and all kinds of other cultures, which mm -hmm. y muchas otras culturas que se representan que es precisamente lo que so Canadá significa así que es interesante ver cómo um, los elementos más fuertes se presentan a través de una fusión para poder encontrar cada uno dentro del tejido urbano canadiense su propia identidad pero creo que lo que tú me estás preguntando también es la interpretación de la casa de fuertemente de esta noción romántica del de pionero canadiense, así que la, la programación que tienen en la casa es uh, de varias noches, pero tiene que ver más bien con cómo los menonitas fueron los fundadores, cómo era esto cuando se estructuró Canadá a través de los menonitas, así que se hace un énfasis totalmente diferente de la interpretación. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, at the back. Thank you. This question is for Jenny. Esta pregunta es para Jenny. Um, I um, uh, am uh, conscious of the differences in heritage conservation practice en las prácticas de between the West del and Japan, entre uh, Japón and in particular of uh, how um, it's uh, uh, in Japan las prácticas tradicionales en Japón son uh, el cambiar, example, digamos, eh, when, um, las maderas históricas por nuevos rot. materiales cuando empiezan um, a echarse a perder las maderas push, de los templos, que um, es totalmente diferente a la forma en la cual nosotros enfocamos la práctica en el occidente. ¿Podrías comentarnos si ha habido una reevaluación por parte de ustedes de este tipo de medidas en Japón? Si los japoneses, o si los japoneses piensan que nosotros tenemos que reconsiderar lo que hacemos nosotros. Una disculpa, no entendí la pregunta. ¿Pudiera de alguna forma eh, para francerla para ver si la puedo entender? O sea, los occidentales, o ¿cómo? Uh, example, Puesto en otra manera, por the, ejemplo, uh, the, the major spruce tree 
las maderas más importantes que tienen ustedes y que son las que constituyen las estructuras básicas de los templos japoneses, por ejemplo, tradicionalmente, si lo entiendo yo correctamente, van cambiando las maderas y se requiere porque éstas se van pudriendo. Así es, exacto. Hebre cada, cada 20 años o cualquiera que sea la decisión. Esto es un enfoque totalmente diferente a la forma en la cual nosotros practicamos la conservación en el occidente. ¿Podrías comentarnos, por favor, si siguen haciéndolo así? ¿O podrías comentarnos? Mi pregunta realmente tiene que ver con la autenticidad. Exactamente. Eh, les encanta la palabra, o sea, el tema precisamente de la reunión del año pasado fue la autenticidad y quizá tú tengas un punto de vista sobre si pudiera en términos de autenticidad pelearse el concepto de la renovación por ejemplo de las maderas o es consistente con la autenticidad muchas gracias Ted por tu pregunta tan importante y precisamente fue el tema de la conferencia del año pasado sí, el sistema japonés es totalmente diferente al sistema occidental y de hecho la mayor parte de los países asiáticos como Corea y Taiwán, también China, o sea, parte de la arquitectura, de la cultura arquitectónica fue hecha a base de madera, así que hay que tener que reemplazarse más o menos cada 15 años y de hecho el gobierno japonés acaba de aprobar una ley para proteger el patrimonio cultural diciendo que se tiene que repaparar cada 50, cada 50 años la madera, 50, 5, 0. Y un punto de vista diferente es la fundación cultural. En Shindo, ellos tienen que tener una identificación especial, mostrar los respetos a los dioses y se van a ellos a, a reparar un templo. Tienen que repararlo correctamente. Muchas veces, cada 50 años, se tiene casi que reconstruir el templo que fue construido anteriormente para la conservación de las maderas. En Japón es la forma de presentar su herencia cultural y respeto a los ancestros utilizando, digamos, una nueva arquitectura. Esa es una forma de hacerlo, esa es la forma en la cual conservan ellos su autenticidad al hacerlo así pero es, digamos, construyendo un nuevo templo y la forma en la cual ellos son auténticos. No sé si con esto respondí o no a tu pregunta. Unfortunately, we are running late on schedule, so if you would like to make a personal comments to the speakers, we can do that on the break so that you can answer your questions or make them any comments. Thank you so much for being here. En estos momentos, el maestro Alan Rojas Orsechowski procede a la entrega de constancias de participación a las conferencistas Chin Yu Chiu Jenny y Hilary Walker Gugan. E invitamos a la licenciada Lucía Sainz a entregar la constancia al moderador de esta mesa, el maestro Alan Rojas Orsechowski. Señoras y señores, los invitamos a tomar un breve descanso, receso.